on the distinction between rights to specific things, or jura in rem, or in re and rights against persons, or jura in personam, or ad rem, 32. We have now to notice the distinction between different types different kinds of property or rights of the greatest importance in economics. Property or rights are of two sorts. One, the property or right to some specific chattel, termed in law a jus in rem or in re, without being related to anyone else. This right is termed in Roman law dominium. When a person has such a property or such role and exclusive right in any chattel, he can sell it to anyone he pleases. Money, cattle, timber, and other material goods are subject to this kind of property. Two, property or rights held in contract or obligation. That is when a person has not the right to any specific chattel, but only the right against a person to compel him to pay or do something. This right is termed a credit or a debt. It is termed in Roman law a juice in personum or just ad rem, aquaridem. A single example of this kind of right is the contract or obligation of debt. In this case, the creditor has no right to any specific money in the debtor's possession, but only a right of action to compel the debtor to pay to him a sum of money. And the right of the creditor against the debtor exists whether the debtor has any money to pay his debt or not. To this class of rights belong all instruments of credit, such as banknotes, checks, bills of exchange, and all securities for money, the funds, municipal obligations, rents of all kinds, of houses, farms, copyrights, patents, pews, telegraph wires, mines, or rents payable in services. The former class of rights are called real or corporal rights or property because they are always rights to two specific chattels. The latter are called personal or incorporal rights because they are merely abstract rights against a person, wholly severed from any specific chattels. Thus, in corporal property, the, rights, the right and the specific corpus cannot be separated. They must always go together, hence the right and the corpus form but one property. But in incorporeal property, the right is absolutely severed from any specific corpus. This class of rights may be bought and sold separately and independently of any specific corpus in all respects like money. This class of property, therefore, and the money they may be paid in form two properties, which may be bought and sold separately. And when this class of property is paid in money by the person whose duty it is to do so, it is always an exchange. The debtor exchanges the money for the right of action, and by so doing, the right of action is extinguished and ceases to exist. But as the whole class of rights to specific chattels and the whole class of rights against persons can be bought and sold or exchanged, and the value of each class of rights can be measured in money, they are, each of them, pecunia, res, bona, mercs, goods, goods and chattels, chattels, vendable commodities, wealth. The want of knowledge of this vital principle has been the cause of immense misconception and error in economics. Thus, Mill, in his preliminary remarks, maintains that the funds are not wealth because they resemble a mortgage deed. And though they may be wealth to the mortgage, they are subtracted from the property of the mortgagor. Now, this is a vital and most important error. The funds and a mortgage deed belong to two distinct classes of property. The funds are jura in persona. They are mere abstract rights to demand a series of payments from the persona of the state. They are incorporal property. But a mortgage deed is the right to a specific thing, such as a piece of land, house, or anything else. When a person mortgages his house or lands, he actually sells the house or land to the mortgagee, and then they become his actual and legal property. What the mortgager has is the right to repurchase the house or land when he pays off the loan. Thus, a mortgage deed is a juice in rem or in re. It is corporal property. Thus, the funds are not a mortgage deed on the property of the country, as Mill and so many others contend. 
They are a charge on the future income of the nation, and the earnings of the industrial classes are as much pledged and contribute to the payment of the funds, exactly in the same way as the income of those who hold real property. The funds are in fact a bill of exchange payable out of the income of the country by installments forever. To compare the funds to a mortgage deed is exactly the same error as to suppose that when a merchant has accepted a bill of exchange, he has thereby granted a mortgage on his lands or a house. Many writers also seeing that certain paper documents, such as banknotes, checks, and bills of exchange, bills of lading, and dock warrants circulate in commerce, consider that they are the, of the same nature and class them all under the de domination, de do denomination of credit. This, however, is a most vital error. Bills of lading and dock warrants are all titles to specific goods and cannot be separated from them. They are only one property with the goods and always travel along with them. They are all jura in re or corporal property. They are termed in law documents of title. But banknotes, checks, bills of exchange, etc., are merely abstract rights of action against persons. They are all jura in personam or in corporal property. They have no relation to the money they may ultimately be paid in. Thus, banknotes, checks, bills of exchange, etc., are independent property, and they are exchanged against goods. Exactly like money, they are credit, and in law, they are termed valuable securities. We shall see afterwards that many literary and mathematical writers have totally misconceived the nature and effects of credit because they have confounded the distinction between bills of exchange and bills of lading. Definition of value 33. Value, as will be shown more fully in the next chapter, is an affection of the mind or a desire to possess some external object. It is the value or the desire of two persons, each to obtain some object, which is the property of the other, which produces an exchange or an act of commerce. Economic quantities are, as we have seen, of three distinct orders, any one of which may be exchanged against any other. Now, if at any time the proprietors of any two objects agree to exchange them, then each of these two quantities is termed the value of the other. Suppose that, at that time, one ounce of gold will exchange for 18 ounces of silver, then it is said that one ounce of gold is of the value of 18 ounces of silver, which is simply this equation, one ounce gold to 18 ounces of silver. Hence, value may be termed the sign of equality between any two economic quantities. We have then this definition. The value of any economic quantity is any other economic quality for which it can be exchanged. Hence, any economic quantity has as many values as other economic quantities it can be exchanged for. And of course, if it can be exchanged for nothing, it has no value. Value then, by the definition, requires two objects, just as distance and the ratio require two objects. A single object cannot have value any more than a single object can be distant or equal. If we are told that any object is distant or equal, we immediately ask distant from what or equal to what. So if it be said that a quantity has value, we must ask value in what? It is also clear that as it is absurd to speak of a qual quantity having absolute or intrinsic distance, or equality, so it is equally absurd to speak of a quantity having absolute or intrinsic value. On money and credit, 34. Number one, in the early ages of the world, there was no such thing as money. When persons traded, they exchanged, they exchanged the products directly against each other, as is the custom at the present day with savage people. Thus, in Iliad 7, page 468, we have from Lemnos Isle, a numerous fleet had come freighted with wine. All the other Greeks hastened to purchase, some with brass and some 
with gleaming iron, some with hides, cattle, and slaves. This exchange of products against products is termed barter, and the inconveniences of this mode of trading are obvious. What hag haggling and bargaining it would require to determine how much leather would be given for how much wine, how many oxen, or how many slaves. In the Homeric poems, there is not the faintest allusion to anything of the nature of money. But even in these days, even in those days, some ingenious person had discovered that it would greatly facilitate commerce if the products to be exchanged were referred to some common measure of value. There are several passages in the Iliad which show that while traffic had not advanced beyond barter, such a standard of reference was used. We find that various things were frequently estimated as being worth so many oxen. Thus, in the Iliad, the second volume, page 448, Pallas' shield, the Aegeus, had 100 tassels, each of the value of 100 oxen. In the Iliad, perhaps it is uh, chapter 6, whereas before I said uh, volume 2, page 231, Homer laughs at the folly of Glucus, who exchanged his golden armor worth 100 oxen for the bronze armor of Diomed, worth nine oxen. In Iliad, I believe this to be chapter 23, page 703, Achilles offers as a prize to the winner in the funeral games in honor of Patroclus, a large tripod, which the Greeks valued among themselves at 12 oxen, and to the loser, a female slave, which they valued at four oxen. But it must be observed that these oxen did not pass from hand to hand like money. The state of barter continued, just as at the present day it is quite common to exchange goods according to their value in money, without any actual money being used. On the necessity for money. 34. Number two. The necessity for money arises from a different cause. So long as the products exchanged were equal in value, there would be no need for money. If it could always happen that the exchanges of products or services were exactly equal, there would be an end of the transaction. But it would happen, but it would often happen that when one person required some product or service from another person, that other person would not require an equal product or service from him in return, or even perhaps none at all. If then such a transaction took place between persons with such an unequal result, there would remain over a certain amount of product or service due from the one to the other. And this would constitute a debt, that is to say, a right or property would be granted in the person who had received the less amount of product or service to demand the balance due at some future time. And at the same time, a corresponding duty would be created in the person or of the other who had received the greater amount of product or service to pay or render the balance due when required. Now, among all nations and persons who exchange or traffic with each other, this result must inevitably happen. Persons want some product or service from others, while those others want either not so much or even perhaps nothing at all from them. And it is easy to imagine the inconveniences which would arise if persons could never get anything they wanted, unless the persons who could supply these wants wanted something equal in value in return at the same time. In process of time, all nations hit upon this plan. They fixed upon a material substance, which they agreed to make, always exchangeable among themselves to represent the amount of debt. That is, if an unequal exchange took place between persons, so leaving a balance due from one to the other, the person who had received the greater amount of product or service gave a quantity of this universally exchangeable merchandise to make up the balance, so that the person who had received the lesser amount of product or service might obtain an equivalent from someone else. Suppose that a wine dealer wants bread from the baker, but the baker wants not so much wine or no wine from the wine dealer. 
the wine dealer buys the bread from the baker and gives him in exchange as much wine as he wants and makes up the balance by giving him an, an amount of this universally exchangeable merchandise equivalent to the deficiency. And if the baker wants no wine at all, he gives him the full equivalent of the bread in this merchandise. The baker wants perhaps meat or shoes, but not wine. Having received this universally exchangeable merchandise from the wine dealer, he goes to the butcher or the shoemaker and obtains from them the equivalent of the bread he has sold to the wine dealer. Hence, the satisfaction which was due to him, which was due to him from the wine dealer is paid by the butcher or the shoemaker. This universally exchangeable merchandise is termed money, and these circumstances show its fundamental nature. Its function is to represent the debts which arise from unequal exchanges among men and to enable persons who have rendered any sort of services to others and have received no equivalent from them to preserve a record of these services and of their rights to obtain an equivalent satisfaction from someone else when they require it. Aristotle, Bishop Berkeley, The Economist, Adam Smith, Thornton, Bastiant, Bastiant, Mill, and Jurist have seen the true nature of money. 34. Number three. The true nature of money is now apparent. It is simply a right or title to demand some product or service from someone else. Now, when a person accepts money in exchange for products or services rendered, he can neither eat it nor drink it nor clothe himself with it nor is it any species of economic satisfaction for the service he has done. He only agrees to accept it in exchange for the services he has rendered because he believes or has confidence that he can purchase some satisfaction, which he does require at any time he pleases. Money is therefore what is termed credit. A whole series of writers from the earliest times have perceived that the true nature of money is merely a right or title to some to acquire some satisfaction from someone else, i.e. a credit. Thus Aristotle says, Nicomac Ethics B. V. But with regard to a future exchange, if we want nothing at present, that it may take place when we do not want something. Money is, as it were, our security. For it is necessary that he who brings it should be able to get what he wants. So a London merchant, F. Credock, in the time of the Commonwealth says, having now pointed out the inconvenience of these metals, gold and silver, in which the medium of commerce or universal credit hath formerly been placed. Now that money is as good as money will appear, it is to be observed that money itself is nothing but a kind of security. When men receive upon parting with that, when, which men receive upon parting with their commodities as a ground of hope or assurance that they shall be repaid in some other commodity, since no man would either sell or part with any for the best money, but in hopes thereby to procure some other commodities or necessary. So an old pamphleteer in 1710 saw the same truth. He says, trade found itself unsufferably straitened and perplexed for want of a general specie of a complete intrinsic worth as the medium to supply the defect of exchanging and to make good the balance. Where a nation or a market or a merchant demands of another a greater quantity of goods than either the buyer hath goods to answer or the seller hath occasion to take back. So the great metaphysician Bishop Berkeley says in his Querist 21, whether the other things be given as climate, soil, etc., the wealth be not pro proportioned to industry, and this to the circulation of credit, be the credit circulated by what tokens or marks, whatever. 24. Whether the true idea of money as such be not altogether that of a ticket or counter? 25. Whether the terms crown, livre, pound, sterling are not to be considered as exponents or denom denominations, and whether gold, silver, 
and paper are not tickets or counters for reckoning, recording, and transferring such denominations. 35. Whether power to command the industry of others be not real wealth, and whether money be not in truth tickets or tokens for recording or conveying such power, and whether it be of convenience that material the tickets are made of. 426. Whether all circulation be not alike, a circulation of credit, whatsoever medium, metal or paper is employed, and whether gold be any more than credit for so much power? See also queries 441, 449, 450, 459, 475, and many others. It is one of the special merits of the economists that they clearly saw the true nature of money. Among many others, Bu Dao, one of the most eminent among them, says, This coined money in circulation is nothing, as I have said elsewhere, but effective titles on the general mass of useful and agreeable enjoyments, which cause the well being and propagation of the human race. It is a kind of bill of exchange or order payable at the will of the bearer. Instead of taking his share in kind of all matters of subsidence and all raw produce and all raw produce annually growing, the sovereign demands it in money, the effective titles, the order, the bill of exchange, etc. So Edmund Bark speaks of gold and silver as the two great recognized species that represent the lasting credit of mankind. So Smith says, a guinea may be considered as a bill for a certain quantity of necessaries and conveniences upon all the tradesmen in the neighborhood. So Henry Thornton, the eminent banker, one of the authors of the Bullion Report says, money of every kind is an order for goods. It is so considered by the laborer when he receives it, and it is almost instantly turned into money's worth. It is merely the instrument by which the purchaser stock of the country is disrupted with convenience and advantage among the several members of the community. This great fundamental truth was also very clearly seen by Bastiant. He says, you have a crown piece. What does it mean in your, in your hands? It is, as it were, the witness and the proof that you have at some time done some work which instead of profiting by, you have allowed society to enjoy in the person of your client. This crown piece witnesses that you have rendered a service to society. And moreover, it states the value of it. It witnesses besides that you have not received back from society a real equivalent service as was your right to put it into your power to exercise this right when and how you please society by the hands of your client has given you an acknowledgement or title, an order of the state, a token, a crown piece in short, which does not differ from titles of credit, except that it carries its value in itself. And if you read with your eyes of the mind, the inscription it bears, you can see distinctly these words. Pay to the bearer a service equivalent to that which he has rendered to society, value received and stated, proved and measured by that which is on me. After that, you cede your crown piece to me. Either it is a present or it is an exchange for something else. If you give it to me as a price of a service, see what follows. Your account as regards the real satisfaction with society is satisfied, balanced, closed. You rendered it a service in exchange for a crown piece. You now restore it, the crowned piece, in exchange for a service. So far as regards, yon, the account is settled. But I am now just in the position you were in before. It is I now who have done a service to society in your person. It is I who have become its creditor for the value of the work which I have done for you and which I could devote to myself. It is into my hands, therefore, that this title of credit should pass, the witness and the proof of this social debt. You cannot say that I am richer 
because if I have to receive something, it is because I have given something. So again, he says, it is enough for a man to have rendered services and so to have the right to draw upon society by the means of exchange for equivalent services. That which I call the means of exchange is money, bills of exchange, banknotes, and also bankers. Whoever has rendered a service and has not received an equal satisfaction is the bearer of a warrant, either possessed of value like money or of credit like banknotes, which gives him the right to draw from society when he likes and under what form he will an equivalent service. So again, he says, I take the case of a private student. What is he doing at Paris? How does he live there? It cannot be denied that society places at his disposal food, clothing, lodging, amusements, books, means of instruction, a multitude of things in short, of which the production would demand a long time to be explained, and still be more, and still more to be effected. And in return for all these things, which have required so much labor, toil, fatigue, physical and intellectual efforts, so many transports, inventions, commercial operations, what services has the student rendered to society? None, he is only preparing to render some. Why then have these millions of men who have performed actual services, effectual and productive, abandoned to him their fruits? This is the explanation. The father of this student, who was an advocate, a physician, or a merchant, had formerly rendered services, it may be to the people of China, and had received not direct services, but rights to demand services at the time, in the place and under the form, which might suit him the best. It is for these distant and interior services that society is paying today, and wonderful it is. If we follow in thought the infinite course of operations, which must have taken place to attain this result, we shall see that everyone must have been remunerated for his pains, and that these rights have passed from hand to hand, sometimes in small portions and sometimes combined until, in the consumption of this student, the whole has been balanced. If not this, a strange phenomenon. We should shut our eyes to the light if we refuse to acknowledge that society cannot present such complicated transactions in which the civil and penal laws have so little part without obeying a wonderfully ingenious mechanism. This mechanism is the object of political economy. So Mill says the pounds or shillings which a person receives weekly or yearly, are not what constitute his income. They are a sort of ticket or order, which he can present for payment at any shop he pleases, and which entitles him to receive a certain value of any commodity which he makes choices of. The farmer pays his laborers and his landlord in these tickets as the most convenient plan for himself and them. It is so clearly understood that money is, in reality, nothing more than the right or title to demand something to be paid or done, that many jurists expressly class it under the title of incorporal property. Thus, Voltia says, money in which not the material, but the value is regarded. That is, we desire or demand other things for the direct satisfaction they give us. But we only desire money as the means of purchasing other things. Gold and silver money may, therefore, be justly termed metallic credit. Thus, it is seen that writers of all classes, philosophers, merchants, bankers, economists, and jurists are all perfectly agreed upon the nature of money. It represents indebtedness or services due to the owner of it, and it represents the right or title which is holders have to demand some product or service in recompense for some service they have done to someone else on credit 34 number four so long as nations continue in a low state of civilization all the money or credit is made of some material substance but when they advance in civilization they make use of credit in another form 
to revert to the case from which we showed that the necessity for money arose out of unequal exchanges among men. Suppose that if instead of the general merchandise called money, by which the creditor can obtain a satisfaction from someone else, the debtor simply gives a promise that he himself will render the balance due when required. Then the creditor has also the right to demand an equivalent at a future time, but only from his own debtor. Suppose that a person holds a tea merchant's promise to deliver a chest of tea when required, and the tea merchant is able to deliver the tea. It is evident that that promise is exactly equivalent to so much money in that particular case. Now that promise is only the right to demand a particular commodity from a particular person, and that person may die or become bankrupt and be unable to fulfill his promise. Hence, the promise is both particular and precarious. But so long as the tea merchant is able to deliver the tea when required, the tea is the value of the promise. And to anyone who wants tea, the promise is of the same value as money in that particular case. This order or promise or right is what is usually termed credit. And though it is of a lower and inferior form, it is clearly seen that it is of the same general nature as money. Moreover, this right may be bought and sold or exchanged exactly like money. Suppose that a second person had performed services to a wine merchant and, as before, had received a promise from him to deliver a certain quantity of wine. Then, of course, the promise to pay the wine would be of the value of the wine. Suppose then that the person who held the promise to pay the tea did not happen to want tea, but did happen to want wine. And suppose that the person who held the promise to pay the wine did not happen to want the wine, but did happen to want tea. If those two persons met and declared their respective wants to each other, they might agree to exchange their respective orders according to the respective value of the tea and of the wine. Hence, each person would obtain the satisfaction he required. The same is also true with respect to every other promise to pay any other product. An order for a shilling's worth of milk or bread is exactly of the value of a shilling in the, these particular cases, and so on in regard to every other product in succession. The only difference is that each order has only one particular value, while with a shilling, he can get any of the products he may require. Thus, while each order has only one value, a shilling has a general value and can purchase any one of them. But these orders are simply so many circulating credits or debts, and they may be, an, be interchanged among their respective holders in any way they please, so that a person who holds several orders for one thing only may exchange them against orders for as many other things as he may require. Now, as in economics, we are in no way concerned with the materials of things, but only with their capacity of being exchanged or bought and sold. And as these orders may be bought and sold or exchanged, exactly like any material chattels, they are termed pecunia, res, bona, mercs in Roman law. In Greek law and goods, goods and chattels, vendable commodities, in corporal chattels, and in corporal wealth in English law, and therefore wealth in economics. From this, it is seen that it is perfectly possible to carry on the exchanges of society without material money. During the great civil war in America, gold and silver money entirely disappeared from circulation and private tickets or orders of the nature described above took its place. Instead of metallic money, people had their pockets filled with bread tickets, railroad tickets, and many others. If a man had his hair cut and tendered a dollar in payment, he could not get change in money, but the hairdresser gave him so many tickets promising to cut his hair so many times. We saw one case in an American paper in which payment was made in tickets or bills, promising to pay in strawberries when the season came on. 
In this country, it is so usual to have credits payable in money only that it is sometimes supposed that credits can only be payable in money. But in the south of Europe, it is quite common to make bills payable in the products of the earth, such as oil, currents, etc. This seemed so novel a doctrine that we shall find hereafter that Lord Cranworth, when Chancellor, asserted that a bill promising to pay in iron was not legal. On substances used as money, 35. The necessity for money has arisen among all nations, the most barbarians as well as the most civilized. As soon as the members of any community, however barbarous, began to exchange among themselves, unequal exchanges must be necessarily must necessarily arise, and therefore indebtedness is created. And some substance is hit upon to represent these services due, and the rights which his holders have to demand some product or service in satisfaction of the services they have done to someone else. A great many different substances have been used by different nations to represent this universal want. The Hebrews, we know, used silver. No money was used in the times of the Homeric poems, but some time after them, though we cannot say when, copper bars or skewers were used as money throughout Greece which Phaedon of Argos in the 8th century BC superseded by silver coins. The Ethiopians used carved pebbles. The Carthaginians, the Carthaginians used leather discs with some mysterious substance sewn up in them. Throughout the islands of the Eastern Ocean and many parts of Africa, shells are still used. In Tibet and many parts of China, little blocks of composed tea of compressed tea are used as money. In the last century, dried cod was used as money in Newfoundland. Sugar in the West Indies, tobacco in Virginia, Smith says that in this day, nails were used as money in a village in Scotland, in some of the American colonies, powder and shot. In Campeche, logwood. And among the North American Indians, belts of wampum were used as money. We read of another people who used cowries as small change and the skulls of their enemies for large sums. It is said that in Virginia, in 1867, the proprietors were reduced to such straits as to use dried squirrel skins as money. And many other things have been used in various countries for the same purpose. But when we consider the purposes for which money is required, it is easily seen that no substance possess, possesses so many advantages as a metal. The use of money being to preserve the record of services due to its possessor for any future time, it is clear that money should not alter by time. A money of dried cod would not keep very long nor would it be easily divisible. So many bankers would like to keep their accounts in dried cod, tobacco, sugar, or in dead men's skulls. One of the first requisites of money is that it should be easily divisible into very small fragments so that its owner should be able to get any amount of service he pleases at any time. Taking these requisites into consideration, it is evident that there is no substance which combines them so well as a metal. Metal is uniform in its texture. It can be divided into any number of fragments, each of which shall be equal in value to any other fragment of the same weight. And if required, these fragments can always be reunited and form a whole again of the value of all its parts, which can be said of no other substance. But when we consider the purposes for which money is required, it is easily seen that no substance possesses so many advantages as a metal. The use of money being to preserve the record of services due to its possessor for any future time, it is clear that money should not alter by time. A money of dried cod would not keep very long, nor would it be easily divisible. Not many bankers would like to keep their accounts in dried cod, tobacco, sugar, or in dead men's skulls. 
one of the first requisites of money is that it should be easily divisible into very small fragments so that its owner should be able to get any amount of service he pleases at any time. Taking these requisites into consideration, it is evident that there is no substance which combines them so well as a metal. Metal is uniform in its texture. It can be divided into any number of fragments, each of which shall be equal in value to any other fragment of the same weight. And if required, these fragments can always be reunited and form a whole again of the value of all its parts, which can be said of no other substance. All civilized nations, therefore, have adopted a metal as money, and of metals, gold, silver, and copper have been chiefly preferred. The Chinese invented paper money. 36. We have now to treat of a material used as money, which in latter times, at least, has had incomparably more influence in the world than all the gold and silver, namely paper. The Romans invented the business, which in modern language is termed banking. The Roman bankers invented checks and bills of exchange, but they did not invent bank notes. The use of checks and bills of exchange by the Romans was extremely narrow, restricted to the immediate parties, and they never, as far as we are aware, got into general circulation so as to serve the purposes of money. The invention of paper to be used as circulating money is due to the Chinese. In the beginning of the reign of Hint Song of the dynasty of Thang, about the year 807 AD, there was great scarcity in the country. The emperor ordered all the merchants and rich persons to bring all their money into the public treasury and in exchange for it gave them notes called Fei Thians or flying money. In three years, however, this money was suppressed in the capital and was only current in the provinces. In 916 AD, Tai Su, the founder of the Song dynasty, revived this practice. Merchants were allowed to deposit their cash in the public treasury and received in return notes called Pian Thians, or current money. The convenience of this was so great that the custom quickly spread, and in 19, 997, there was paper in circulation to the amount of 1.7 million ounces of silver, and in 1021, the year 1021, it had increased to 2 million 830 million ounces. At this period, a company of 16 of the richest merchants were permitted to issue notes payable in three years. But the end of that term, the company was bankrupt, which gave rise to much public distress and litigation. The emperor abolished the notes of this company and forbade any more joint stock, joint stock banks to be formed. Henceforth, the power of issuing notes was kept in the hands of the government. These notes were also called kios su and were of the value of an ounce of silver. In 1032, in the year 1032, there were kias sous to the value of 1,250,340 ounces in circulation. Subsequently, banks of this nature were set up in each province, and the notes issued by one provincial bank had no currency in the other. These were the first bank notes on record, that is to say, notes issued in exchange for money or convertible into money and not paper money or paper created without any previous deposit of specie. Besides these bank notes, the Chinese manufactured paper money to a vast extent. It would be too long here to give a complete history of the paper currency of China, but we have given some full notices of it elsewhere. But it may interest our readers to know the process of its manufacture. About the year, 1288, Marco Polo traveled to China and discovered the existence of this paper money. In book two, chapter 18, he gives an, an account of its manufacture. He says that it is made in Kanbula, Kanbalu, the inner rind of the mulberry tree was steeped and pounded in a mortar. And then made into paper resembling that, uh, resembling that made from cotton, but quite black. It was then cut into pieces nearly square, but of vast, but of different sizes. 
the smallest were of the value of a denier tour no the next for a venetian grout others for two five or ten grouts others one to ten gold besants several officers had to subscribe their names and place their seals on each note which were then stamped with the royal seal dipped in vermilion counterfeiting was a capital offense it had then a forced currency and no one dared to refuse it on pain of death caravans of merchants arrived with their goods which they laid before the king who selected what he pleased and paid them in this money when anyone wished to exchange old money for now it was done at the mint at a charge of three percent if anyone wanted gold or silver for manufacture they could obtain bullion at the mint in exchange for the paper marco polo mentions many cities where he observed this money in circulation in the next century sir john mandeville traveled in china and speaks of this paper money this emperor may dispendent Alamok as he while with on ten estimation for he dispenseth not he maketh no money but of leather m printent or of paper paper and of that money is some of greater price and some of lesser price after the diversity of his statutes and when that money hath runneth so long that it beginneth to waste, then man beren it to the emperor's treasury, and then thy taketh new money for the old, and that money goth Thorge out all his provinces, goeth out all his provinces, for there and be zonde them, and beyond them, thy make no money, neither of gold nor of silver. And therefore he may dispense it now and outrageously. Credit in paper, neither payable in specie or in convertible, now forms the great circulating medium or currency of the world, and as we shall show hereafter, amounts to at least 50 times the quantity of specie in this country. Credits payable in service, 37. In every obligation or contract, the party who has the right to enforce the performance of the duty is the creditor, and the party whose duty it is to perform, it is the debtor. The words of the digest are general. A credit is the right to compel a person to pay or do something. Hence, large amounts of credit are payable not in any material substance, money, or any other, but in personal services. Thus, in feudal times, rents were payable not only in money, but in products of the earth, termed rents in kind, but also in personal services, and such rents were termed rent services. And the person who has the right to demand a service is as much a creditor as the person who has the right to demand the payment of a material substance. And the person who is bound to render a service is as much a debtor as the person who is bound to pay some material substance. A jaded legislature has taken shootings in the highlands. On the 10th of August, he goes to the office of the railway and pays five guineas for a ticket to Inverness. That ticket is a credit. It is a bill of exchange payable in a railway journey to Iverness. Inverness or a person wishes to see Irving in Hamlet. He has, perhaps, to buy a ticket for a box a fortnight in advance. That ticket is a credit, or right of action, or a bill payable in seeing Irving in Hamlet. A college engages one of its members at a quarterly salary to give lectures to its students. The lecturer gives his lectures, and thus acquires a right to demand his salary from the college. This right of action is the credit or debt. member of the university gives lessons to private students. The fee is paid either in advance or after the lessons given. If the fees are paid in advance, the student acquires a right of action. 
a credit or a debt against his tutor to demand so much instruction. If the lessons are given first, the tutor acquires a right of action, a credit or a debt, to demand payment for his lessons. The master of a household engages servants and agrees to pay them wages monthly or quarterly, as the case may be. When the servants have performed these terms of service, they have a right of action against their master for their wages. A right of action is a credit or debt. So there are innumerable other cases where persons contract to perform professional services. These contracts to perform services are as much obligations as contracts to pay material substances. Hence, credit can purchase services exactly in the same way as money. It is a purchasing power which can affect any result that money can. The function of credit is to bring into commerce the present values of future profits. 38. The true function of credit is now apparent. It is a very common idea that credit is the goods which are lent or the transfer of them. Such ideas are utterly erroneous. We have shown that a credit is the present right to a future payment. And the true function of credit is to bring into commerce the present values of future profits. When an estate in land is sold, the present value of all its future profits is expressed and brought into circulation or commerce by the money paid for it. The total amount of the shares in any commercial company, banking, railway, insurance, cattle, or any other denotes the value of the existing property of the company, together with the total present value of their future profits. The money paid for the goodwill of a business, a copyright, a patent, a professional practice, etc., is the present value of their future profits. So when a merchant or trader trades on credit, he brings into commerce the present value of a future profit. He buys the goods or the labor and gives, as their price, the right to demand a sum to be paid out of the expected profits. So when the state contracts a loan, it buys the money and gives, as its price, the right to demand a sum of money out of the future income of the people. So when municipal corporations and other public bodies contract loans, they buy money by giving, as its price, the right to demand payments out of the future revenues of their constituents. So credit in all its forms and to whatever purpose it is applied simply brings into commerce the present value of a future payment. <laughs>